Scientists estimate that one infected person passes the virus on to around two to three people on average. So what if we used all the data that we already have on our smartphones to track people infected with the coronavirus and warn those who had contact with the carrier? Prevent more infections, build something like a digital vaccination. In South Korea, that seems to have been one of the keys to keep their infection curve flat. Surveillance. Can data tracking help us fight the corona crisis? Welcome to our special coverage of the global COVID-19 outbreak. Today, we want to take a closer look at South Korea. The country was hit hard by the coronavirus early on, but now it has seen a steep decline in new COVID-19 cases. Compare that with numbers in Germany. They are currently nearly 10 times as high. In recent weeks, it appears South Korea has largely reined in the disease and without closing down public life to a degree we're seeing in Europe and elsewhere. Now, how have they done it? Nobody knows exactly, but making use of internet technology to share confirmed patients, locations and travel information directly with the public seems to have helped quite a lot, actually. South Korea seems to be battling the coronavirus COVID-19 effectively without implementing a complete lockdown. In addition to rigorous and innovative testing for the virus, online applications and social networking have been crucial. To encourage ongoing public participation in the battle against the coronavirus, every day South Korean health authorities send text messages to everyone's smartphones. The advisories remind people to avoid large groups, practice two meter safe distancing and regularly disinfect their homes, leaving the windows open. South Korean health authorities' emergency alerts share the locations of new coronavirus patients. People can then follow the links to detailed patient tracking data. Web developers like Ryan Junso Hong have collected and aggregated that information to more user-friendly websites. The government provides the travel history of each confirmed patient, but also that's in the text format. So even if you uh, read that place name, you don't really know where exactly it's located. So I tried to plot that out on the map so that people can um, efficiently see where it's exactly located so that they know if they've been to that place. The South Korean public has become a bit complacent as the pandemic drags on. So websites like this may help remind people that the risk of infection is still out there and possibly nearby. There, there are lots of people like still in Korea who doesn't really wear masks because they think they didn't have any contact with the confirmed patients. But with this website, they have better idea of that and then they can really, you know, deal with the uh, situation better. Since their creation in late January and early February, independent coronavirus patient tracking websites have received millions of page views, offering users reassuring information. When the coronavirus became a threat, I downloaded the apps and started using them to understand the situation. You can see where infected people have been and avoid going there. It helps to stop the virus from spreading. South Korea has managed to flatten the curve and reduce new cases of the coronavirus in recent weeks, although health officials here still worry about potential new clusters. Well, from uh, Seoul, South Korea, I'm now joined by Professor Jung Won Son, Associate Professor at the Bartlett School of Planning, University College London. Uh, professor, after a peak at the beginning of March, South Korea has kept new infections very low. You say besides that testing program, that's due to surveillance. How? Yes, tracing through surveillance technology played a very big part in, in this fight against the coronavirus. If the country has very big capacity of testing, if you don't know who to test, the testing capacity has only limited use. So to find out who to test, surveillance technology was really helpful. So the goal is to find out everyone, every single one, uh, the patient, confirm the patient contacted in the past. So that way you can find out who this patient got virus from, and who this patient could have given virus to. 
Uh, what kind of data exactly has the government there gathered? Because the initial data is the interview of people. Those experts interview, uh, interview patients to, to asking where they have been. But then uh, the Center for Disease Control gets access to police data, uh, the three sources of data through police. And that's a credit card transaction, mobile phone uh, locations, and the CCTVs. So this mobile phone, um, every every mobile phone service networks have information about where mobile phone has been through GPS and the transceiver connection records. And the second, the credit cards, um, it's again, the banks can tell you uh, where and when the transaction happened. So combination of these two already gives you a lot of, a lot of data. So for example, if a cashier was, was a patient, for example, uh, every, every single customer is a potential patient. They have to be tested. And using credit card records, um, you can find out all the, all the credit customers. And then uh, CCTVs have, can give you even more finite movement data. Uh, who the patient talked to in the past, who the patient bumped into, for example, and then so on. Mm. Can I so uh, just interrupt you there? Three, Don't three, you three, think, three, Professor, it is, it is dangerous when a government can track every step of its citizens? It is. It certainly is. So, so this is this is an emergency measure. On, only when the uh, only when the president approves it, the Center for Disease Control gets access to these sources of data through police. So, when the situation is over, they don't have they they they, they don't get access any longer. Professor Jung Won Son joining us live from Seoul in South Korea. Thank you very much for this input. Now that answers a few questions about how South Korea handled the fight against the virus, but fresh questions around the global outbreak arise every day. For us here at DW, it's your questions that are most important. And you have sent us plenty via Facebook, Twitter and email. And to answer them, at least a part of them, uh, like every day, here's our science correspondent, Derek Williams. If we start data tracking, are there any assurances in place the technology won't be used against us in the future? That depends a lot on the country, I think, where you reside. Um, any assurances put in place will have to come from governments. Now, there's no question that digital surveillance measures like cell phone tracking that are used to trace the contacts of someone who has been infected are one of the most effective ways that we have to find out who else might have been exposed. But a big fear, of course, is that once given the right to track their citizens in this way, some governments might continue to do it once the current crisis is over. And it needs to be addressed in any legislation expanding the rights of governments to track their own citizens. Um, so striking the right balance between outbreak oversight and, and data privacy is not going to be easy. What data can be used to track the spread of the coronavirus? Well, nowadays, practically all of us leave a kind of trail of digital breadcrumbs behind us as we move through our lives. If you have GPS or Bluetooth turned on on your phone, for instance, then that can provide pretty specific information as to your whereabouts or who you might have come close to. Other information that can be used is, for example, when or where you might have made purchases with a bank card or a credit card. And then, of course, in places that are directly monitored via CCTV, you can employ facial recognition technology to pretty precisely determine exactly when someone was where. Um, in South Korea, which has so far had some of the greatest success at containing the virus, without resorting to draconian measures like lockdowns, um, tracking the previous movement of people who tested positive has relied on a combination of, of all those measures. Can big data help us avoid a second coronavirus outbreak? The short answer to that is no. The only thing that will stop COVID-19 for good is herd immunity, which Hopefully we will acquire through a vaccine in the not all too distant future. However, there are many ways that big data techniques can help us better control 
any future outbreaks. They can help us recognize when one's beginning at an earlier stage to start with. And they'll also tell us a lot more about what measures being instigated all over the world at the moment actually work best. So even if it doesn't solve the coronavirus problem for us, um, big data is providing valuable information all the time on how we can hopefully solve the problem ourselves. I'm Gerhard Alfers in Berlin. Uh, at the end of the show, we leave you with pictures from Bergamo in Lombardy, Italy's region hit hardest by the novel coronavirus. The streets there are virtually empty as the country is sacrificing almost all forms of business activity to fight the pandemic. But when they're crowded again, data tracking will be an issue to avoid a second wave of the pandemic and to stop governments and companies from tracking every move people make. <laughs>